Uh, next, uh, we get uh, our uh, overview of the industry from the chief executive of the Construction Equipment Association, and that is Rob Oliver. He's been the chief executive at the CEA for over 20 years. He's got that wisdom of two decades of change and adaption in the industry, and now he's going to share his outlook for the construction equipment landscape. Rob, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Declan. Um, uh, I'll try and live up to your uh, your billing as offering some wisdom, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll just uh, see what PowerPoint has got to to offer us today. Good. Well, thanks uh, for the opportunity today to just say a few words um, and really talk about some of the things that uh, come across my desk as chief executive of the CEA. Um, for those of you who don't know the CEA. Um, we've been going back uh, to about 1940s, that's where we can trace our roots back to. Uh, we have about 150 members, three of them are actually presenting today, I'm pleased to say. And uh, we also own the Plantworks exhibition, which uh, many of you have been to, and the promoters of the Caesar scheme, which was set up uh, to address the problem of, of plant theft in the industry and is a uh, as a database uh, and marketing system for for machines, and I'll actually talk a little bit about that later in the in the presentation. Um, I, I guess in terms of of digital, it's such a big subject um, that and the definition of of digitization, which you can see on the screen there, um, really doesn't really bring to life what it. Uh, what it actually involved, and a fairly random list of, of uh, digital applications are shown there from artificial intelligence uh, to augmented reality and everything in between. Um, what I've done to do, first of all, is actually share some information on the uh, state of the market, because in terms of my presentation, I want to try and explain why the pandemic tragic as it has been uh, over the last 18 months, uh, actually provides a, a significant opportunity for our industry and an opportunity for those that are offering digital solutions. Um, and, and also in the course of this presentation, I've, I've stolen a few slides from my friends at the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, those of you that maybe attended our, our recent CEA AGM will, will be familiar with some of these slides. But um, quite obviously, the construction industry was badly hit, as with other sectors, uh, around about March, April of last year. And you can see the, the, the dip in activity and output from the construction sector, uh, which kicked in. But what you'd also see is, is quite a, uh, uh, an encouraging and swift um, return to, uh, to output um, in the uh, really from the late summer onwards, you can see that the curve in those lines is going uh, going up. And if you look at the predictions for 2021 for this year, you can see there's some very significant upturn, which is, which is predicted. And uh, if you look at the right-hand column there, the prediction for the upturn in total construction is a whopping 26%. And, uh, and the other elements there uh, deal with infrastructure up 40%, uh, others private housing up 30%. Uh, so it's all quite an encouraging landscape in that point of view. If we drill down a little bit and look at where we are in terms of the construction equipment market, and uh, here I've borrowed a slide from my friend, Mr. Paul Lyons, who I can see sitting there in the virtual audience. Um, you, you, you'll see, uh, again, a very V-shaped um, recovery in terms of the, the sales of construction equipment, where we're comparing um, quarterly sales. And uh, uh, towards the end of last year, you can see that we go from the, the red figures to the black figures. And most significantly are actually the latest figures, which is the quarter to the uh, end of uh, March of this year, where we've seen a 30% uptick. Now we would expect that kind of figure because if you compared the, uh, that quarter with the previous quarter, well, that was just when COVID was starting to strike and, and, uh, and things started to get very tricky. But if you, if you compared uh, that number 
and that uh, part of the line for, for March 21 with March uh, 19, um, that's actually something like 2.9% up on uh, 2019, which of course was a non-COVID year. So uh, again, that's a very significant indicator to show that, that the market is, has rebounded very strongly and that there's some prospects of, of, of sales uh, topping the 2019 level, which were, which were fairly good in themselves. Um, two things then are, are probably uh, going to be very, very significant in driving future sales. And they really are interlinked. In, interlinked. So you, you've all heard the phrase build back better. Um, there's some dispute as to who came up with that. Uh, Boris Johnson started using the phrase uh, in May last year. And uh, the, the then presidential candidate, Joe Biden, weighed in uh, with that from July of last year. And that's become his mantra. And if you're following the investment plans in North America and the US, uh, you'll see that Build Back Better is very much a big campaign. And there are trillions of dollars um, scheduled to to go into that uh, program there of infrastructure investment. And similarly, uh, as we've heard from the previous speaker in terms of the zero carbon agenda and the decarbonization, um, that's being very, very heavily driven. As I think we all know, we have the COP26 conference scheduled for Glasgow in November of this year. And again, our government uh, is making great play of um, that being able to host that and, and has actually ramped up their own um, decarbonisation uh, targets um, since the announcements of COP26. Um, and of course, now the Biden administration is in, they're actually showing some leadership on, on that issue as well. So um, if you take those two parts together, which is building back better after the shock of COVID, and better actually means greener, because greener then uh, starts to meet the decarbonisation targets that have been set. Uh, I've just gone over that. Let's go back one. Um, and the reason that uh, construction has yet again been uh, chosen as the way of stimulating the economy uh, it's not difficult to understand. Um, when there's ever been, when there's been an economic sh shock going right back um, to uh, the days of, of when Maynard Keynes was the top economist, um, the injection of government spending to stimulate demand and, uh, and to stimulate uh, gross domestic product uh, has always been one of the first tools that government turns to. Uh, it's slightly ironic that um, that the in, that the sectors that have suffered the most, of course, are hospitality and, and leisure. Uh, and apart from some subsidies on eating out last summer, um, there's not a lot that government can do to stimulate demand when there's an element of of lockdown or uh, social distancing involved. So, um, so we've been fortunate in the sense that government was very supportive of keeping the construction sites open during the last year and we've seen from the figures that that's the effect that that has had um, but also very supportive of, of investing in infrastructure going forward and uh, I've just put up on this particular slide the uh, uh, piece of work that was done by the uh, Chancellor Institute of Building last year where they estimated that the value of the construction sector was something over 10 percent uh, of the overall economy. And uh, one of the old statistics, which we always uh, trot out, but is nevertheless, uh, I think, quite an accurate assessment, that for every pound of construction output generates nearly approaching three pounds of total economic activity. So um, this is why government uh, has now turned its attention very much to the roadmap to recovery, um, which has been sponsored by the Construction Leadership Council. On this particular slide, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the colored parts of the plan on the left may be a little bit indistinct, but I'm just gonna pick out uh, a couple of things on the right there because um, the, the plan there was actually a recovery plan, which we're part way through anyway. 
Um, and you'll know another uh, Boris Johnson phrase was, was Project Speed, which uh, he announced very early uh, in, well, probably just in late spring last year. And, and that was a commitment to accelerate the construction pipeline. And government identified 340 projects worth up to something like 37 billion pounds uh, to be uh, escalated and to be um, speeded through. Um, now, what we don't know yet is how successful that is going to be, because we've often heard of uh, uh, a government promises to, to speed up investment in infrastructure. And sometimes these things do hit the buffers or do get slowed down, but the intention is certainly there. And the clear link then with the, with the carbon zero part of it is to the bottom of that slide, where under the construct zero, which again uh, has been promoted by the Construction Leadership Council, uh, they've set out a nine point plan uh, to reduce carbon emissions in the industry. And if we look at that plan very briefly, uh, of that nine points in construction zero, the one of most immediate interest to uh, the construction equipment manufacturers is, is the very first point, which is the acceleration of the shift of the construction workforce to zero emission vehicles and on-site plant. Um, and as, uh, as Aidan uh, covered previously, um, that, that uh, particular aspiration very fits, with, fits very much with uh, the electrification uh, of, of machines, but also there are other options which are, I'll come on to. Um, so uh, if you look at the, in the nine points in total, I think they look at all the key areas where we're going to see pressures to, uh, to decarbonize. Now this issue has been taken up at the European level um, the, in, in Europe as a whole, there's an initiative called the Green Deal, which again is a, is a, uh, a rebuilding program, Build Back Better program, uh, but um, called the Green Deal within the European Union. Um, the CEA is a member of the uh, Committee of European Construction Equipment, and uh, they have been working on uh, their perception of what the roadmap may look, look like in terms of the decarbonisation. Uh, of construction equipment going through 2035 and 2050. And the, the assessment is based around what we call the four pillars. Um, the bottom right hand corner deals with alternative energy sources. So we are talking about electric drives, we are talking about biofuels. In particular, I think we're talking about hydrogen where I think uh, there are some very big opportunities there. Um, but whereas when you go to meetings as I do, when this whole issue of decarbonisation and sustainability comes up, um, uh, the suggestion that uh, electricity or the use of electricity is, is the be and end all is not quite right. It's very important, but it's only part of, of one quarter of one of these four pillars. And the three other pillars, which you can see from the slide, um, first of all, deals with the machine efficiency. So it's about how you put the machine together and how the different components can be optimized and working together. And that in turn actually uh, relies on a certain degree of digitization with the different components effectively uh, communicating to each other. And, uh, uh, and of course, the bigger picture anyway is, is the whole manufacturing process uh, and what the carbon footprint may be of that. So you have to look at the, the holistic view uh, of, uh, of the environmental impact. Uh, you then get to operational efficiency. Now that is very much to do with, with operator training where you have operators. Uh, and of course, in the future, we've, as we've heard, uh, there may not be so numerous, um, but then it's encouraging those operators or training those operators uh, to get the full benefits of the intelligent uh, machine use. Um, uh, as we heard from the BOMAG uh, presentation, uh, you can have semi-autonomous use where you can have someone in position on the, on the operator seat, but the machine is, is working for itself. Um, so again, that I think uh, is a, a big area because it's to do with the uh, making sure that the machine 
is working to maximum productivity. And if you if you, if you can do that, that actually makes a contribution to decarbonisation. Then the third area then of those four is in process efficiency. It's about having the uh, right equipment for the right job uh, used correctly and uh, get from that uh, establishing an opt optimal workflow. Uh, and as it said, in, it, including the choice of the machine or the combination of connected machines. I think the point was made earlier from one of the other presentations about the connectivity between machines and the, and the absence of that in a lot of situations. Um, and as I think I'll, I'll point out later, um, that maybe coming towards a system of, of open systems and connectivity might actually um, promote better process efficiency on job sites. Moving on, um, just the, almost at random, but I had five pointers to, to the digital boost, which I've called. So let's have a look at some, some different aspects um, that uh, are going to be uh, significant going forward. First one, uh, again, that's been mentioned. Um, when we uh, left the EU, um, uh, it uh, removed the possibility for us to continue um, the, with the same labour profile that we had for our construction sites. Uh, our European guest workers, um, uh, some will still remain because of the um, policies government put in place from allowing them to do that. But there's a general recognition that um, the numbers available to work on our construction sites going forward, particularly in a boom period, um, uh, is, uh, are going to be constrained. And uh, if you look at some press reports earlier this year, that labour shortage is translating into higher rates uh, of labour. And as labour costs uh, uh, take off and get uh, more expensive, then that will mean uh, that the application of newer technologies uh, will commensurately become more affordable. More affordable for two reasons, because the, the, the labour to capital gap is, is closing, um, but also as uh, newer technologies uh, are used more and more as standard, then their relative cost will fall anyway. The second point, um, early on in the presentation, we saw the sales graph of uh, what was happening in terms of sales of construction equipment. Thanks to digitization, actually the sales graphs are much, much less important than they were. It's actually the utilization rates of machines, which are made possible by the use of telemetry to get that data, which is now uh, more important. Um, uh, and our colleagues at CSU in Europe actually have a group uh, looking at this, uh, something called they call the Uptime Tracker Program, uh, to see whether um, the uh, data can be collected on a, on a pan-European basis. Uh, I first became aware of the importance of this probably four years ago, sitting in an international meeting with other trade associations from around the world, and our friends from the Chinese associations already had that data, and that was four years ago. So I think we're a little bit behind the curve uh, on that uh, particular data source. Um, the third uh, area too is again, something I hinted at before, which is um, uh, a, a quote I've included there from the Center for Digital Built Britain. Um, Openness is a central principle for achieving effective information management of the built environment. And uh, that has been a frustration in the past where there have been some excellent uh, systems that have been uh, introduced by CEA members and others, um, but, the ink, uh, but being able to harvest the machine data from a, a mixed fleet uh, uh, has been a challenge. Uh, I think there's a lot of work now going on to um, mitigate that. Um, but in the same way in the past where we, we uh, started to use personal computers, it was only when we started to use the same platform that we could communicate between those computers. Uh, and we had the digital revolution that we've had in our own homes and, and households. Number four, um, the 
Yeah, and, and this is something close to home for, for the CEA actually, but it's uh, it's quite an interesting one in terms of, of marketing approach. And that is that um, with the absence of physical meetings, physical trade shows uh, and other opportunities for people to get together with our business, um, it's led some OEMs to to take uh, different routes uh, to market and look at possibilities of different routes to market. Um, so, for example, there's been a lot of product launches over the last year where people hadn't been able to attend, but they'll still be done virtually, and I think in many cases very successfully. Um, and what we're seeing now is that some of the leading OEMs are deprioritizing um, their support for traditional trade show formats uh, and looking at engaging with their customers and potential customers uh, more on a virtual basis or more on a, or even on a more local basis. Um, it was interesting for us to see, for example, that the biggest trade show in the world, um, bar none, of, uh, so it's the biggest of any sector in the world, which is Bauma, um, they've been affected by the pandemic and that they've postponed their event from April of next year to the end of October. And that attracts something like, in the past, something like 600,000 people. And the final example that I'd give there is that um, if we're going to improve uh, our performance in terms of decarbonization and environmental impact, you also, you always have to have some um, ways of me measuring that improvement. And for the last uh, two years or more, the CEA has been partnering with the uh, air quality people at HS2 um, to help them in meet their targets uh, and meet their uh, uh, compliance requirements for the equipment that is used on their site. Um, and what we found, and this is by me an application of big data, is that we were sitting on a database of something like 300,000 machines with our CESAR scheme, which is agricultural equipment as well as, well as, uh, as uh, construction equipment. Um, and so we've been able to adapt that database to supply information on emissions in the terms of what stage engine is in machines that uh, uh, are being used on site with HS2. And, and Balfour Beatty as a main contractor has been very supportive of that too. Now, what I'm going to do now is to we'll just put a short video up there if I stop uh, screen sharing and we'll see if the wonders of science works. Managing emissions on the road is pretty easy. And we're on our way to having greener, cleaner cities. But on construction sites, it's not so easy. Without any registration numbers or other unique identifiers, it's hard to know how clean a construction machine is, even for site managers. Caesar ECV solves this problem. As the only official registration scheme for construction machines, we've been capturing all of the important data about construction machines since 2007. Now, with Caesar ECV, we can easily display engine-specific emission data with a triangular security marking plate that features a five-digit alphanumeric code. With our easy-to-use clearing portal, managers can create projects, add sites, and invite suppliers. Suppliers can then add their machinery manifests based on ECV codes so that the system can provide each machine specific data that will be required on site, including engine emission levels. From there, auditors and project managers can drill down into this ECV data to ensure compliance. Less confusion, less errors, and more understanding and control of construction machine emissions. With clear, color-coded, visible labels displaying each machine's emission stage, you can ensure any non-compliant machines are kept off-site. To find out how you can get involved, head to caesarscheme.org forward slash ECV. Um, so uh, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd slip an advertisement in there. So, uh, uh, but if you're interested in finding more about Caesar uh, ECV, please do contact me and I'll put you on to uh, the operators of that. Um, and finally, just one little cautionary tale. Um, digital can be a great enabler, as we've seen, and, and it's going to have a fantastic, is having a fantastic um, influence on the progress of our industry and will continue to do so. But it can also 
be a disruptor. And many years ago, back in the last century, I chaired something called the Photo Imaging Council. And uh, around that table were the senior executives from names like Fuji, Kodak, Canon, etc. And suddenly this thing called electronic imaging uh, came about. We wondered what it was worth. It, it was then called uh, digital imaging eventually. Uh, digital imaging then superseded the old way of taking photographs, which involved you having a camera, it involved you having a film, and it involved you having to spend the money on developing and processing to get your prints. Um, some of those companies in that sector were very slow to adopt this new technology. And Kodak, for example, was one of the top 10 brands in the world for any products. Uh, it fell by the wayside and is a shadow of its former self. Because today, when you think about Fuji and Kodak, um, Fuji was last in the news because they are involved in uh, providing um, chemicals and support for new vaccines against COVID. And Kodak are now more known for chemicals and their work in, in pharma. Um, last year, they got a $700 million loan from the American government to, uh, to manufacture uh, hydroxyl chloroquine, um, which was a, actually a treatment against malaria. So it's a, a long way away from their old uh, stomping ground of cameras. Um, and it was also uh, a chemical which uh, for a certain period, the President of the United States thought was very good to counter COVID. Um, so watch out for your, your potential for digital disruptors and the way you may need to change your business and change your products accordingly, because just uh, in the future, you may get have to compete with machines like this, uh, which is a combination of a pneumatic drill, so it's just a model of it, a dozer and a 3D printer. Um, coming to a construction site near you, um, the only thing to watch out for there is, is actually made of Lego. So think about what materials you're making in your machines as well. So that's my final thought. Um, it, the future is going to be interesting and I hope you all have a very successful part in that. Rob Oliver, thank you very much. Uh